Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Devil You Know, The Daredevil Podcast. I am Phil. Hopefully, we'll have Lilith here soon. But <laughs> once again, it's it's that, it's that time again. Oh, yeah, she said start without her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yes, it's, as you can hear, yes, it's that time of the month again. We got Mr. Gigi Chichester back. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, Phil and Lilith, wherever you are. Hello to you. We'll get you on here soon enough. Yes, we'll be here. All right. So this time we were talking uh, Daredevil 305 and 306. June yes. 5, 1992. Yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's the... It's the uh, I love this one. It's the guest starring Spider Man. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a fun one. It is the only, um, it is the only uh, plots uh, that Ralph Macchio, as my editor, outright rejected on the uh, on the first go, um, <laughs> and, uh, and said, "You got to go fix these." <laughs> so um, I do. It does stick out in my mind for the, that reason, especially. Oh, uh, Lilith just messaged me. She says people are mowing their lawns very loudly here, right at the moment. <laughs> by her or by she can hear by it. her. By her. By her. Oh, it's, man, everyone's getting it. I guess it's I'm surprised thing. can't hear anything around my house. So why did he? Why did he reject it outright the first time? Well, they were grisly. I mean, the story's kind of grisly, uh, um, and uh, you know, certainly if folks haven't haven't read them. Uh, you know, we'll talk more about the plot maybe, but there's a, there's a character called the, the surgeon general, who is a, a sort of a new villain that we brought in, in for this. And she's harvesting body organs for profit, which is just not a pleasant thing to, to do or think about. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this was probably at the apex of also when I was writing a lot of uh, the Clive Barker, uh, material. Clive Barker being very famous uh, author and filmmaker who specialized in, in horror for folks who don't know his work. And uh, I was very invested in that and doing a lot of that work. And when you do, when you live in that world, probably a lot of things seem very natural <laughs> to you to kind of go the extra distance in uh, how much more strange can this get? And, and I think that because, well, this was not a horror story, certainly had horrific elements in it. And uh, I think I may have went too far with some of the descriptions or scenes and Ralph uh, rightly, you know, reined me back in and reminded me, this is Daredevil, not Hellraiser. And <laughs> both may have devils in them, but they're, they're very different characters. So, um, you know, he, he reined me back in and, uh, and whatever I can't remember the specifics of what that that was, but definitely uh, uh, fix things up. Although there still are some, you know, having reread it uh, in yeah. prep for this, there's still some kind of grisly things, senses and sloshings and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. So exactly. I mean, I, and again, I, did you see something like? or read something in real life that inspired the surgeon general, because I found it interesting that it's like, usually if someone teams up Spider-Man and daredevil, like the uh, temptation is always like, Oh, we got to bring in like a straight up super villain. You right. know, it's just something ridiculous, like stilt man or something, but, it, <laughs> but, I, but yeah, I was like, this isn't like a, you're running, this isn't like a super villain. This is just basically just like an evil person, you know, harvesting organs for profit. So, yeah. And it's fun. Uh, I'm glad that kind of came across. Uh, and I know there's like a line in there where uh, Parker or Spider-Man says to, to Daredevil something, you know, your bad guys aren't very nice. <laughs> You know, as terrible as as his rogues gallery is, uh, and and it is uh, in a lot of ways on the Spider Man side, especially when you get into your venoms and your carnages and mm. and um, um, but but even the run of the mill guys, quote unquote run of the mill, you know, Electro's terribly powerful and and so forth. Um, yeah, the outlandish qualities of them probably offset things. You know, this is a pretty. Uh, uh, nasty you know villain and, and what she's doing and she's definitely like a profiteer in that way uh so uh, i thought that was an interesting line that kind of probably wasn't i don't even know if that was in the plot but um 
you know, seems like that might have been one of those things that kind of came out as I went through writing it and that realization of it. Um, I know at that time, whether it was an urban myth or or not, you know, urban myth, you know, being one of those stories that is always passed around. Hey, I, I got a friend of a friend who heard this, but nobody can actually validate anything. Um, there was there were certain stories of things like this happening. You know, people going out for a good time, mm. uh, and that's kind of what happens in the story. For folks who haven't read it, you know, it starts off with somebody going out to to clubs and having a great time and thinking he's going to score with an attractive woman, and and then finding out he wakes up the next morning or uh, later in a park in this instance, and geez, I don't feel so well, and he discovers he's been operated on, and and organs that could be sold for profit have been removed for his body. So it's not just Dexter level grisly activity. It's, it's somebody actually profiting off his, his body. So there were urban myth stories. I know kind of going around at that time, probably none of them really validate it. I've, I've probably flagged it. Like I did a lot of stuff we've talked about and said, geez, that's, this might make a good story. Um, and, and it was probably something I played with a couple of times. And this is the word, it came to life in its biggest way. Um, but I don't know if it's a story that really, um, uh, it, it actually holds up better than I think, you know, that's what I like about doing this thing with you guys. I go back and I reread these things and stuff that I sort of said, I don't know if that really came together. It holds up pretty well, Oh yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's just a weird, it, it's a weird thing. And then I never revisit it. Right. We don't go back to the surgeon general and we don't really return to her, even though again, she's sort of, a character you could have you could have done more with um but i don't know if the grisly nature of it really fits the you know the overall theme of of things even though it has a very street level quality to it but that's probably where it came from i don't know if those stories were ever really validated or if that that was all just the type of things that people said oh yeah that happened to a friend of a friend of mine but nobody's ever been able to say things like that really happened that's the sad part. It's like, yeah, I don't know if it's true, but I could completely believe it. I mean, just with the way human trafficking works and stuff, I could see people like, Oh, I could see it. That's, that's, I think why it had that, that oh, if, yeah. it, if it's not real, that's probably why it keeps resurfacing. It's funny. I, I just watched, um, uh, was goaded into watching the entire run of justified. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but, um, uh, you know, about a, a kind of a shoot from the hip, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, old old west lawman type in modern day kentucky i guess and uh timothy oliphant is the character so it's a great uh, persona but it actually had oddly enough halfway through this organ harvesting story <laughs> so um they either had the same clip file i did or it was just uh said hey here's something we can do do you think your editor was like a little extra cautious about this story because you were doing the spider-man uh, team up um, well, they were right next to each other or two, two doors down from each other. This would have yeah. probably been, uh, Danny at this point, Danny finger off. Um, so, um, we definitely had to get permission to use Spider-Man, you know, making sure he's not off planet or, or something, you know, at that time, he's not another dimension or somewhere we could actually kind of grab him. Um, and obviously we had to acknowledge and work within the confines of where he was at that point. You could sort of see me bending over backwards to acknowledge be because daredevil for folks who, who haven't read the story drags peter parker in because peter parker's a young guy he's a good looking guy he wants to use him as bait essentially in these nightclubs to lure this surgeon general character into picking him up but of course peter parker's married at this time so <laughs> you can't just sort of throw which again it sort of shows matt's manipulative side you know <laughs> to, to sort of just i'm gonna, I'm gonna use people and things to, to kind of get what i what i need um but he uh, uh, uh i don't remember any um any reaction from uh the spider office on you've got to change this and you've got to do you know do this mm -hmm. um as grisly as this story kind of uh nods to in some of these uh things you know, it doesn't hold a candle to carnage. So, I mean, I'm, 
<laughs> um, um, this is this is a Phil. This is like a, a bedtime story for kids compared to some of those <laughs> tales. <you know? laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I, I felt more comfortable reading some Carnage stories than this. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, again, it, and it, like, I mean, it is. It holds up because, again, except for the reference to the marriage, this could be Spider-Man at almost any point, you know, in modern storytelling. Yeah, and I think that's always where you you kind of come around to the certain um, aspects of of these characters that work well are things that um, you can return to. Mm. And, and they're nice touch points, which doesn't mean they're static, har hardly, right? None of these characters are, are static. But the essence of them that you want to play with um, uh, maintains itself. So if you're writing Spider-Man or putting Spider-Man in a story, uh, he's, he, he's not grim and street. And you, you see that. Uh, uh, Daredevil's quite grim in this story, you know. He's he's really okay. upset and he's really you know sort of sort of charged up. Um, in retrospect, a little too much, you know. Maybe um, maybe that's something Ralph should have me dial down a little a little bit more, play with in a in a different way. But hindsight's always twenty twenty, and you sort of wonder where you are at certain points in your head that also influence what you do, not just from a story influence, but sometimes why. You know what's going on in your real life sometimes plays out on the page <laughs> within the story and and that's uh like that's infamously like why uh you know a movie like indiana jones and the temple of doom is so is so grim and and nasty you know uh because what george lucas was going through a divorce and steven spielberg was doing something else so <laughs> like their life almost comes through I mean, I, I thought it worked, especially coming off 304, which we'll get to like towards the end of the year. It's like, I mean, you already showed Matt really cares about people. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, you know, just the ongoing, you know, Surgeon General's, you know, just indifference to human life just kept getting the math. And eventually, yeah, at the end of the second one, he's just basically just like, you know, I can't take this anymore. That's exactly it. And I, I, I think um, uh, I think that was certainly the essence of the, the story. That uh, that indifference to human life compared to what he was, um, who he is and how he acts. That's a big, big part of it. Um, I, I guess you know, again, you can just I can be very self-critical uh, of things, and mm -hmm. and I think there's probably just some places where I wouldn't have changed the intent. I might have, I might have uh, smoothed it out a little bit, you know, in terms of how he he reacts and kind of gets gets in the face of things or gets himself so wound up and he even questions himself, you know, within the aspects of the story of like, why am I feeling this way? Um, uh, uh, Foggy comes in at one point, right. Talks to him about, mm -hmm. you just reset your life, right. We just, we just got you back on track after, after 300. Where are you? Where are you now? What are you, what are you doing? You're, you're falling back at old patterns. Um, and, and in essence, whether foggy knows or doesn't know and i think we've kind of played it out that foggy sort of acts like he does know yeah you know, the both sides of things um then you you just rescued both sides of your life you can't now risk one for the you know for the other but yeah i mean and again i think the uh you know some people would just have spider-man guest star to guest star which i'm sure there was like sales things in there the considerations but i think spider-man worked as like the other side of foggy in this you know in these issues because you know spider-man was out there in the field with matt you know as as matt's mm -hmm. you know his anger is building towards the surgeon general it's, it was good to have spider-man there to say you know hey slow down slow down you know you get you know you don't want to become hurt you know right it's good to have a foil otherwise it's all internal monologue and and characters can represent you know certain things and different sides of it um and um i think it also just gave uh, scott mcdaniel you know some nice places to play with uh with uh with visuals of the characters above the city which opened up the story you know okay. some there's some really nice a couple splashes or that sort of thing you know where they're they're just hanging on top of buildings which of course these guys do <laughs> you know all the time but but that also just can gave some uh you know some uh uh nice opening up of the story from the darker elements as well by having them be themselves or uh and by that i mean kind of 
you know, playing with the rooftops in their, in their own ways. So, um, you know, it was good to, good to explore that. And, and I think, uh, you know, foils, you know, by playing off other characters is, is always interesting. It's a way then to see how they react to somebody without you having to have the character state everything himself or herself. And I mean, as dark as the story as it was, there were time, you know, you were able to fit some humor in there. Cause I, I love when, you know, when Peter goes undercover, he has to have the <laughs> mustache on and, you know, and it makes sense, you know, <laughs> the, the cheesy mustache. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, I acknowledged that at one point of, uh, because he's somewhat well-known or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, there's definitely moments in that. And then once you get into Spider-Man territory, he became a way to lighten things up because you can have him do his trademark quippishness or, or uh, you know, throwing asides or questions or, or what are you doing? Um, because that's the, that's the playfulness and, and, and aspects of that character, you know, that get to get get stretched out so um, i i mean my fa- i think my favorite part of that is like you know surgeon general's about to attack peter and like, you know he's like waiting for daredevil was like anytime anytime and yeah that just grabs him and throws him off the building he's like i know he'll stick to the side of the it, building. exactly it's sort of you know he says yeah now i know why they call you daredevil and, <laughs> and it's and he just yeah he just chucks him over um and uh uh, hello. Speaking of woman who has, Sorry uh, about that. Speaking of woman who has stabbed men. Hello, little hellfire. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry about that. You've That's got it. a powerful green screen behind you. So what are you going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> How have you been? Pretty good. How about yourself, sir? Good, 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 good. We were just uh, throwing uh, Peter Parker off a rooftop when yes. you joined us. <laughs> My favorite moment, but no, it's so funny that you messaged me about the uh, the lawn mowing because, like, right before we started, he was like, oh, "Hey, if it gets too loud, let me know. I can close the window. There's people outside." Like, mowing. yeah, it's the and day it's for funny. it. I guess hey, it's summer, you know. We got a new neighbor. They don't know no better because I kind of like let my neighbors know. <laughs> <laughs> don't 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 mess with the atmosphere around this time. So you got to yeah, do. we all we all kind of agreed in their new so. Yeah, there were some good, um, you know, places to play with the city there. I mean, I remember taking a, uh, there, there's a friend of mine or an older friend of mine, you know, who gets name checked, I think, um, mm. in 306. Uh, there's a thanks to a guy named Jonathan Fishman, who at that time worked down at uh, the World Trade Center, you know, and, and uh, so he was able to get me um, kind of a walking tour okay. uh, within the Winter Garden area. You know, which oh, we used wow. as, a, as a setting, uh, you know, there where there's that uh, that party of all the of all the folks, and then the Surgeon General and her team move in. So it was nice to be able to get that as as a, a walk through and get a sense of the space. And I think it it comes across. And I was able to get photo reference for Scott to work with. So um, it, things like that, I think, make it feel like it's more. Um, more real and gave me an idea for some of the the action scenes and sequences to suggest to, to Scott that you know we we knock them through this or we blow up that or or whatever. Uh, that and that's cool. where that film school intuition kicks in <laughs> <laughs> above and beyond, sir. Above and beyond. Sometimes you know, sometimes I mean, you just get that that, uh, and and I like that. I always I've always liked having the reality of things you know to well it is set in an real, actual real place in a real yeah. world yeah that makes sense you know enough you know while you can make things up the more um the more detail you can give to something i think it makes it more real for for you nowadays artists can probably look up anything they want you know really quickly but but again at that point in time it would have been extremely difficult to say hey they're in the setting and even if i described all the glass and the pylons and the you know, the views, Scott would have still been scratching his head saying, I don't really live in New York. What am I going to do with this? So. <laughs> and again, I mean, you said this story holds up and it absolutely does just because, you know, like, like you said, except for references like the World Trade Center or Spider-Man's marriage. I mean, this could have be happening pretty much at any point in time. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it's uh, no, it's 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 it is relatively, you know, solid. That's why I enjoy 
you know, again, appreciate what you guys have, are doing with me here because I get to go back and reread these things and sometimes say, ah, that story doesn't really work. And um, but no, it's a it's a solid story. And um, there's a couple of things on the nose. I mean, her last name being Cutter, I probably wouldn't do nowadays, you know. But <laughs> it's a comic book. It's fine. <laughs> it's you know. It's, and again, let the editors make these choices too. I have to, you know. Think there's, a, there's a grand tradition there. I mean, a guy named Otto Octavius became Doctor Octavius. <laughs> so true. So true. We should have had a team up with them. You know, that's uh, could have gotten them. Uh, like I said, I appreciate. You know, they always always the temptation. You bring in Spider Man, you're going to have like a super villain. You know, you know, even if it's just like somebody cannon fodder, like Stilt Man or Shocker or something. But no, you just kept it. You know, again, just the very evil person. Well, don't bring up stilt man or we might have to have stilt man September. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well we covered we covered stilt man. We should have talked about stilt man more with the Grease story, you know, and, and kind of kind of played that out. But it's um you, you know you mentioned before Phil I, I I am sure I am beyond sure you know that including Spider Man was was a partly a sales ploy, you know, as much as anything else. How do we you know, how do we pattern out, you know, certain things within the book to both do good for the character and do good for the, his own storylines, but acknowledging the fact that we live in a in a larger universe of characters, but also a larger universe of sales concerns. I'm sure there was something about, ah, can we get some spider in here? Um, and that would have been, again, the, the reason that the spider office would have said no, not because we didn't get along with them or that they didn't like the story, but you can only spread if they're being responsible, the character can only be spread so many places, you know, in one month. Right. So Spider-Man was in demand. The X-Men was in demand. Wolverine's in demand. Um, all the high ticket items are in demand. So it, fortunately we got in early enough. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, they, they allowed us to kind of like, uh, you know, play with this. Um, now later it's so on, weird because it yeah. just seems like Spider Man and Daredevil they kind of like go hand in hand. Like their stories, like you just there's so many classic stories. You would think that nobody, but he would hesitate to say like, oh yeah, Spider Man and Daredevil, let's make that happen again. <laughs> there was yeah, there was no there was no hesitation on on that from a a storytelling point of view or a character point of view. But I definitely there was a sense, that, and things were a lot looser in those days than I'm, I'm sure they are now. But there were still points in time where the editorial office would try to assert certain control because 50, 50 different comics want to use Spider-Man this month, which means, A, we got to keep track of 50 more stories than we normally do. And also realistically, big air quotes around that, how is Spider-Man, Peter Parker and all these places when he's also supposed to be doing all this stuff in his own book and storyline. So, uh, you know, you can, this is where, monthly continuity comics work for you and against you <laughs> at the same time because people get too over concerned with you know with that kind of stuff we can't possibly be you know life down. pro tip if an editor ever says that to you new comic book artists especially if it's any character living in new york it's new york it's the city that never sleeps peter never sleeps uh, he can do it there's, it's, there's it's that. plausible that. but you know th this this would be how could it be downtown at the world trade center when you know, he's uptown in this other comic or something like that. I, I don't know. Yeah, let's, make it, let's make it believable. He only had three, what, three books at this time? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's, he can get around. He can get around. No, but we didn't. We didn't have any any. Uh, as I said, we didn't have any issues uh, with that at all. I mean, the, the biggest issue, as I said, was Ralph. You know, doing a course correction on my story sensibilities, and that was uh, that was the right thing to do. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, sometimes you, it feels a certain way, but I mean, reading your stuff, like, I never thought it was like, oh, he's milking the the uh, guest stars because, you know, early on you had Punisher, then goes Trader. I never thought you were like, oh, yeah, he's just throwing him in the. No, like I said, Spider Man made perfect sense. You know, the spider sense would be able to tell him who Surgeon General was because they didn't even know what she looked like at this point. Right. And that was the fun little things, you know, like, how do I ping this person in the room and, and, and draw it out? So once we had somebody. Uh, it was my it was my nature to want to use them to their to their best ability and how do you play it out um, you, you know Ghost Rider 
<laughs> that doesn't doesn't necessarily fit in Daredevil's world. But once I had him uh, in that particular issue, uh, we played it out well. I remember Bobby Chase, you know, being very positive on how we used Ghost Rider in that, which probably ultimately led to me doing some work with her with the the Midnight Suns comics. Um, so here, once we had Spider Man, how do you play him off? And I think. Um, well, I pro probably didn't think about it when we when we first said, "Hey, let's get Spider-Man in some in some issues for sales reasons." Um, I wasn't thinking that, "Oh, I'm going to do this really dark story, and he's going to be the perfect foil because he's lighter in nature." Ultimately, that then becomes exactly how well he works because he doesn't have a counterpoint. If, if Spider-Man wasn't in this story, I don't think it would work as well, uh -huh. right? If this if this was just Matt and Daredevil pursuing this really grim villain, it, it would be a different, you know, it would be all that grim stuff all the time. And that would be too much to take um, uh, in, in a particular, in a particular story. So it was a gift in some ways <laughs> to have that ability to play it off. Well, like I said before, yeah, you know, Matt cares about people so much, and then he just got, he started getting, you know, more angry with Surgeon General, just, you know, just her apathy and stuff. Mm -hmm. so you needed someone there to say, yeah, you know, back down, back down. Right, right, right. Or just let the pressure off in a couple of things. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, turn the pressure up, and then Spider Man quips about something or, or whatever, and then you get a chance to, to, to change the dynamic a little bit, even if Matt may not acknowledge it the reader can acknowledge it, right? The reader's got a little bit of a different uh, a different moment in time. I was going to say, you probably don't have that original script you were talking about, do you? It was probably a victim of the crash. Uh, yeah, there's so much. I mean, I still have that hard drive somewhere. And, and you know, I, like the physical hard drive, I actually tried to send it into one of those mm. hyper secure places at one point that, you know, for several thousands of dollars would go in with a white glove treatment and guys, I guess, and like hazmat suits. In the suits clean and, room, yeah. Yeah, the clean room, exactly. And they just sent it back to me and said, yeah, we can't do anything with this. So they, this is one of the, you know, places that'll charge you big money for it. And they were like, nah, but I've held on to it. I'm sure there's nothing to be done with it ever. So I should just drill through it and just toss it. But no, I've got, it's the great tragedy, Phil. It's just, I, I'm just curious me. because Lil T was Sloppy saying... Floppy would have never done you wrong. That's all I'm saying. You know? <laughs> but, then, but then the thing with Floppy Disk, I wouldn't have anything to read the Floppy Disk on anymore. Right? You can't, you can't plug a old Floppy Disk player into a modern computer. You'd need so many dongles and connections. <laughs> You'd never... I'm just, cur I'm just curious because little he said this is the only story his editor like uh you know denied the first time because i guess it was so gruesome the first time he had to like tone it down yeah it was it was it was modern um, comics would have never done that to you sir probably <laughs> no but what i said i said to phil at the beginning ralph ralph Macchio, the, the editor was right and 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 probably and ralph ralph himself quipped but i think he was he was absolutely on the right uh, wavelength he sort of said you know, this isn't a Clive Barker comic, and I was writing oh, so wow. many. Of the, so I was writing so many of the Clive Barker titles at that time that probably, you know, I was in, in a little. Yeah, I was in the zone over here, and then it's yeah, you know, uh, devil here, devil here, and you just don't separate the two. So when Ralph called me out on that, I was like, okay. So I can't, I can't imagine, but I. Um, I probably could imagine, but you know. <laughs> well, I said it's 1992. I don't know if they went their mascot Spider-Man in a story like that too. It's like, oh, my seven-year-old picked up this Spider-Man. Oh, please! <laughs> when, when was when when were the Carnage comics? Right? Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Please, I mean, I know. I do not. I do not. <laughs> the, the things that Spider-Man went through in his own titles, mm -hmm. I I do not under any circumstances. I this could have been full-on Hellraiser. <laughs> and and it would still have been Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm compared to some Carnage stories. So I, I Spider Man went through a lot. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, we we took good care of their character. We yeah. oh yeah we uh, we were respectful. We treated him um, in the right way. And if and believe me, knowing Danny uh, Fingeroff, uh, if if we were off base, Danny would have 
I had no hesitation of marching into the office and eh, this ain't gonna happen and <laughs> throwing throwing the plot right down and tell call Dan and tell him to to make it work. So the fact he did not means we were we were in a good place. Oh no, I'm a big fan of <clears throat> Spider Man and especially this era. And I think he you wrote him very in character. It, it's it sounds just exactly like Peter Parker. Um, and it's fun, you know, because I think uh, at that point Scott's style was still. Um, he was still exploring different things and he hadn't quite found, you know, what he would, he would later become. So, you know, his, his Spider-Man in this issue in these two issues is very, I always think it's kind of like Bagley esque. It's got a sort of a, sort of a more stretched out, you know, Mark Bagley feeling to it, which, uh, which also I think. And that's always a good thing. <laughs> and that's always a good thing. Yeah. And, and it worked, worked well for, you know, for a character. It's, it's funny looking at this stuff now though, because, uh, for me, at least, you know, everything about Scott to me just zones in as fall from grace and afterwards, you know, including like the lecture and all those those other things. So when I look back at this, I see both his overall character style is different, but his storytelling style is different, too. Like even though even the choices he makes of how to break things out from panel to panel um is is less stylized um and and sort of more call it standard you know it's good storytelling no, no matter either way but in my head i'm so used to that that when i go back to this i'm like oh yeah you know, it's a, just a different rhythm that's like the sign of a great artist like you could see like them uh, you know uh, evolving over time you know the other you know if it's if it just stayed the same over years and years it's just like oh okay Oh yeah, and there's people who do that and do that fine, and then there's people who are, um, you know, who are actually extraordinarily good at oh, what yeah. they do, and then they they get challenged. Um, over the uh, beginning of the week, I don't know if you guys saw it. There was this heartbreaking, um, uh, I thought it was heartbreaking, uh, kind of thread on on Twitter about um, the artist Herb Trimpey. You know, do you know his work at all? Oh yeah, Herb, you know Herb. You know, I mean. Uh, an amazing artist, you know, and, and, you know, uh, d developed Wolverine and did seminal work in the Hulk and mm -hmm. many, many other things. And this thread was just about how it probably around this time, you know, frankly, you know, 90, 95, 96, uh, you know, his style and, and the style of sort of call it the old guard, you know, became marginalized, right? Because of the newer, Mm. artists and the hot artists and the you know what was perceived as well this is what people want to read in comics and so guys like him who had uh amazing talent and amazing storytelling ability were 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 just not being used as much and that became problematic for their livelihood and some of them um tried to adjust right tried to but not even evolving like they were being told by editors kind of do this do more of this, but that's not you, mm -hmm. right? So you're not even having a chance to evolve. You're just being told, try to do something you don't really know or feel how to do. So, um, but fortunately, you know, that's not the case with, you know, Scott. Scott was just learning, I think, you know, who he needed to be or wanted to be rather. Um, and it was fun just to be part of that journey with him. I mean, I like looking at art and being able to, tell, you know, tell a different, oh, okay, this is McDaniel or this is Trimpy or, yeah. You know, Whoever it is, and do you think I don't know more modern comics with more digital uh, ways of doing art? Is that is it becoming more? I don't know, cut and paste, and just you know, more people's styles are looking more similar just because of digital. I don't know. I, I mean, there's so many artists that work just in so many different ways, and you know, that's kind of the beauty of. Uh, and every generation has that that style, you know, that sure. they, they kind of idealize and kind of work from too i think I mean, has a there, lot to do with that yeah i mean i think there's there's some comics today that are are so over rendered if you want to you know think about that i mean certainly the comics in the 90s you know got very over rendered in a lot of ways and look how many pockets i can put on here um but pouches. it's uh, <laughs> pouches pockets uh but there's um i think the digital thing phil probably to me probably comes most of the four when you see what coloring can do to some styles because you can look at things uh with digital coloring that can 
drastic well coloring can always drastically alter i think a, a black and white image oh, yeah. um but i think the uh an over rendered quality and coloring can take it too far really easily where somebody using digital coloring can really you know draw out and i think that gets back to um just how much it's how important it is that everybody working on a on a on a book or a story kind of is in sync with each other or at least has a chance to touch base with each other because without it, you're sort of in silos. Oh, I'm gonna color this and I'm even gonna think about what the artist was trying to do. Or I'm gonna ink this and I'm not even gonna think about what the artist was trying to do. So um, there's so many, there's a lot of artists who do, do also do, I think very much uh, a combination. I mean, I've seen Lee Weeks, you know, to stay in Daredevil world, you know, um, I mean, I've seen him on, on some of his Facebook, um, you know, video streams, uh, do work on the computer and then i've seen him like leaning over the the drafting table getting more ink on himself than he is on the page half the time but you know but, it, but it's you know he's so i think it's whatever feels right for them at least at that generation you know and do you think a lot of and there's is everyone i don't know if the artists or the people at marvel too are also considering it's like you know digital comics are so much bigger now so it's like how is this going to translate you know the people reading this on a screen as you know as opposed to paper i don't get that sense at all unless you know just as a reader um unless it's been developed specifically for like a webtoons you know sort of thing or and and i don't think there's i would i would like to see more of that i'd be really interested as a reader and a creator to see more of of that specific thinking mm. but i don't think there's i think probably 90% of things are just thought of as it's a comic page and then we're going to be able to like run it through whatever the comicsology engine or something and then do the you know the panel shift if we need to but do you guys read a lot of digital comics yourselves so how do you Lilith when you read do you look at the whole page or do you use that sort of panel to panel scan that some of them have it actually depends on like the company for Marvel. I do the panel to panel, uh -huh. and then for other things like say like Image or like um, Archie Comics, I kind of do it the other way. <laughs> and why is that? Does it just feel like I don't the know? Flow? It's just like the flow. Yeah, like when you look at a page, like because I've been just doing it for so long. When I look at a page, it just I'm like, nope, I got to switch this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just like I don't know. It's just like one of those brain things. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's. Um... You know, I think that that scanning, I guess, the, 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 the reason I was asking the question, I think the scanning, Phil, is 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 just kind of it's easier to zoom in on things. Uh, yeah. But I don't think that I don't think the story has been rethought. This is how somebody's going to read it. That's just a kind of a, like a zoom function, right? Oh, people can't see as well on an iPad, so they're going to zoom in or, or whatever on it. But I think if comics end up if some comics end up being created specifically for the screen, um, yeah, it'll have a better flow. <laughs> well, or, or you'll play out things in a different way. I mean, I've been, um, uh, you know, there were about six or seven comics I did toward the end of my, like, real time in comics, right? Which were the Marvel cyber comics. Did you guys ever see these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so these were, like, really early experiments in digital comics. And, and they were fun to work on because I was really interested in that. But... But those were revealing panels and things in crude ways, but they were being triggered specifically by things you were doing as the reader, right? You would click on a on a control panel and that would make things happen. Or the panels would sort of shift in and out um, in a different way than, than just moving from you know one to the other. I don't know if that's any better or any worse from a storytelling point of view, but it's a little bit more tied into when we created them, we had to think about, uh, all right, uh, uh, Captain America is going to, going to slide into panel here, you know, versus we're just going to go to another complete panel or, you know, sound effects are going to trigger this or this it was, it was a weird experiment. I wish I had those scripts. I mean, frankly, I wish I would love to know what the hell I was writing. <laughs> to describe those things because I, I um, those don't exist anymore as far as I know in a way that you can actually interact with them yeah. I just 
captured a lot of them as videos back when I still had the programs that could run them. So as far as I know, they only exist as as like video captures versus things that you could actually interact with like a computer program. So I'm guessing you're, yeah, if you're afraid of another big crash, because what was it the other day? Was it on Facebook or Twitter? I saw you were like, I'm going to start writing everything on this again. And it's, was it a typewriter? <laughs> this is the Lego typewriter. Oh, I, I, it was because I'm just such a big Lego geek. Um, they actually are coming out with a Lego typewriter that is, uh, um, you know, I don't know how many pieces or I'm sure it costs way too much money, but, you know, the keys actually work when you press down the keys. It's got the little, <laughs> like, that's you know, whoever designs Lego things has just the best job in the world and just just crazy creativity and mechanics and the way you can sort of put things together and okay. that's and there's actually if you've seen it and you maybe you haven't if you're not a lego fan there there's actually a daily bugle um lego set that they came out with i saw that that thing's huge and it wasn't off like 20 or 30 figures or something and it, there's a daredevil figure in there yeah. like which is as far as i know the only official daredevil figure um uh, <laughs> so, now, black people only sell the daredevil figure. Well, I was. Keep everything but, else. But how bad is this? I was. I, I and I remain severely tempted to purchase that kit. Just you know, for the daredevil. For that reason, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd build it too, but it would just be. It's one of those unwieldy things that you're really not gonna. You don't have a place to put it up. So when you see the big daily bugle behind them next time, kids, you'll know where that came from. Exactly. <laughs> What's that thing on the shelf? Man, took place in there. I'm always I got I have I have enough Legos over there that I'm and I'm I'm always worried that I'm gonna like knock into them uh, and knock over something and destroy it. So, see, I was I have a good excuse. I have an eight year old, so I could be like, oh yeah, the old Legos for him. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that's so. But that's how I acquired most of mine. My son was mad for Legos when he was young, and we have many kits. And he was he was. Um, he had actually built the Death Star one, which is like a giant, oh, yeah. you know, which is incredible. And he was so careful about it uh, forever and ever. And literally, he had one of those moments, like in the Spider-Man movie, where a friend of his literally tripped over and destroyed it on him. So oh. it was one of those just moments of time to move on. Time to move on. <laughs> uh, so going back to this story. Uh Oh my lord, Lil! Do you have any questions? Because I uh, know I hogged the beginning of this episode. No, feel free. <laughs> uh, I swear I had a question and it just blew out of my mind. <laughs> uh, let me ask you. Brain. Let me ask you guys a question. Um, just you know, when characters like this are introduced into a story, you know, like this villain, um. And then, you know, for various reasons, you know, does, does the characters like this feel like they should come back at some point? Or does it feel like her story was so complete in the way that it was wrapped up that, no, I don't, I don't really think she needs to kind of come back or be See, used back again. in the 90s, you could have that feeling. But modern comics, it's like you just always feel like it's always like a cliffhanger or a little breadcrumb. They could come back even if they never do. They could come back. But, yeah, mm -hmm. this felt kind of complete. Okay, but, if they, but then it's like if they do come back, it's like ooh, new plot. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right, right. I and mean, is is that okay though, as a reader, when a story feels complete like that, or or do you feel cheated because you sort of want that feeling that that there's gonna, you know, I I want to be threaded on. I like a sense of completion sometimes because there's some characters that never come back and you're just left wondering. And they mm -hmm. didn't have a completed arc, and you're just like, hmm, somebody dropped the plot on that. I don't like that feeling. That is the worst feeling. <laughs> right, right. I've seen so that. So I do and like a complete feel... arc for a villain. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if they come I, back, that's icing on the cake for me. I mean, I felt that this, I mean, it, was, it felt like a completed arc, but I mean, I wouldn't have minded seeing the character again because I did like her as a foil for Matt. I just thought, you know, she was a nice little opposite, you know, like opposite of him because he cares so much about people and she just sees people as, you know, profit. Yep. And I'm always like, well, why didn't she come back? You know, was this always your plan? Or are you just like, maybe he just never got back to this character? But yeah, I mean, it, it felt like a completed arc, but I would have loved to see her again. That's interesting. No, that's good. And then good to know. I think, I think, um, you know, looking back at, at this stuff and other, other things, I think one of my, uh, 
one of my Achilles heels, you know, was I seem to introduce characters that I think are interesting now and probably thought they were interesting then. And then I just, uh, I just keep moving on. Well, let's create another set of new characters. <laughs> and maybe I should have spent more time going back to them. And, uh, I mean, there's always the danger too. You don't want to come back to the same villain like every two months too. Exactly. <laughs> to the villains that shall not be named. Hi, <laughs> yeah. Venom. Uh, Here's your yearly appearance, like well, clockwork. <laughs> well, and you know, when you got those numbers, I guess that makes sense. Like, let's just keep finding a way to bring it back. But as a professional comics writer, it's like, do would you? I mean, maybe if it's somebody you trust or you like their writing, but it's like, would you want someone else to have picked up this character, or would you, would you have been afraid that they would have? Are you afraid people would like misinterpret your characters? Well, people always misinterpret characters. I mean, that 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 happened all the time. Um, but when people you trusted did things with them, th yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was that was the most fun. I mean, you know, and there was there was certainly people, uh, um, you know, I I trusted a lot. You know, who I was friends with or long time, um, you know, allies with. Who, if they want to kind of go run with it, uh, you know, Greg Wright was. Uh, uh, you know, came in and out of the Daredevil universe, you know, a lot because of his relationship with me and and Ralph and such. So Greg could have picked up on anything, and and far as I was concerned, and played it out, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have looked twice, you know, in that. Um, you know, where this story goes, uh, you know, from here when we get to Vegas, right? We play the Dead Man's Hand stuff yeah. out, and and that's with. Uh, uh, Fabian and, and Chuck and uh, Chuck Dixon and, and uh, uh, you know, those guys I knew well. Right. So uh, so we were doing a crossover story there and and that's wasn't playing with a character like this. But, yeah, whatever you're going to do, I know it's going to be good. I know you're going to leave. I know you're going to respect what I give you, like as the handoff point, And I know you're going to give me back something that I can work with and not just here's a huge mess you go figure it out. Right. You know, which, <laughs> or I'm going to take your character and, and run away with it and do the strangest things possible. And then you're going to scratch your head and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and want to, is that even my character anymore? Or like, or a character I recognize? Probably not. I mean, we're going to definitely do dead, dead man's hand at some point one day, but it's like, I wonder if we could get those other two guys too. Cause I think it would be interesting just to be like, okay, did you, you know, how did you see, you know, you know, did uh, DG, uh, you know, translate the Punisher the way you thought he, he was uh, Chuck and it's like vice versa. You know, how did you think they handled that they're, you know, that they're double in their books and. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I mean, I remember working that story out over lunch. <laughs> I, mean, I mean that's how that's how easy that was I, that was I, and maybe i'm misremembering it maybe they thought dan was a complete bore and he was impossible to work with but i, I remember going out to lunch with those guys and saying and and and, I, and we just sort of sketching out the whole the whole sequence and and uh and saying this is what's going to you know the major story beat's going to end here Fabian, you're going to pick it up here. Major story beat's going to end here. Chuck's going to pick it up there. You know, Dan, back to you or whatever it was. You know, however the the thing and that and that was. And then everybody kind of goes off and does it, and then and then I'm sure we called each other or sent each other the plots or faxed each other the plots and that modern technology that that cracked me up reading this one. It's like that, like using the fax technology. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if you could get them together, they're, they probably have far better memories than I do. Certainly Fabian never forgets anything. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a well-oiled machine, you know, three guys who respect each other. That's like, uh, my, it's last couple of weeks, Lilith and I have covered some of the Atlantis attacks annuals. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know how you guys did, like people just like, you know, when the annual thing goes through, like everyone's annual that year, it's like, and the, basically the whole Marvel lines like in there, I'm like, how do they do that? Yeah, sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's just a nod to things. You know, sometimes you know, oh, I've got to acknowledge that New York has been sent into another dimension, yeah. <laughs> and that's all I need to to sort of you know put a headline on a on a newspaper in that day, or you know, a, a broadcast on a on a TV monitor or something. Um, but sometimes it's integrated, and you've got a lot more to to do. 
and always better when you in my experience when you have the creators thinking things through and having a chance to kind of connect on that because they would then really invest themselves and that that's true with any creative thing i mean that's when you when you invest yourself in it and you really feel like you're you're thinking it through more then it comes to life better and you want to run with it as being as opposed to being told you're a set of hands do this with this character right right uh -huh. like, like once getting back to spider-man and, and these issues yeah I, I guarantee you we said let's bring spider-man for sales i'm going to be completely honest <laughs> you know like that's that would have been you know a reason to do it but once we had spider-man then it was well, you not want just, the reader to come back you, you know, want the reader to come back after he's well. gone yeah but you also want to make it work for you because if the story doesn't work for you yeah you know, then you're just going going by the numbers, you, and so that's where it starts to become, you know, you lose yourself in the story a little bit, and you let Spider-Man actually drag you into different places than you thought you were going to go, because he is going to do that. That character is going to tell you, if you allow him or her, to take you into some cool, interesting places, and that's where those type of crossovers or whatever uh you know become better because you've been allowed to uh you know move with the character and the storyline versus just being told have to do this you know so um have you ever had like a a person uh, that wanted their character to do a crossover with daredevil and you're just like nah. <laughs> wouldn't work like let let like we're in an in an instance where somebody said they wanted to use Daredevil and yeah. and play it out. Um, the only instance I could think of was just after three hundred, where a lot of people still wanted to use the Kingpin, and they wanted to use the Kingpin as if he nothing had happened. Like people would come to us with plots and say, "Oh, the Kingpin's you know in a skyscraper and he's lording it over New York and he's running it." No, 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 no. We just we just destroyed Fisk. We just completely tore him down to the to the roots, but why not? Why can't we do this? Because we just did this. <laughs> so if you want to use Fisk on the streets, and you know have him kind of doing some street level thing or whatever, fine. But we're planning to kind of build him back up. That was the only instance where we I can remember us sort of saying, "Don't play with it in that way." We we always try to be good um, citizens and sharers because we knew that at some point we'd want to use somebody else. So uh, we, we tried to be, you know, nice, nice, nice folks about that. All right. I'm going to cut that there. Uh, again, thank you, sir, for another great month. Uh, yeah. Well, we've got a lot of behind the scenes uh, talk this time, but uh, all right, before we go, uh, to let them know where they can sign up for the newsletter and uh you know like i said mention that appearance you're, you're doing at the end of july all right my plug time great uh please uh if, you, if you're interested in more of this type of stuff sign up for my newsletter at storymaze.substack.com uh it's about a once a week newsletter with behind the scenes stuff like this and other writing and writing ideas and then uh, my first convention comic book convention that i've actually been invited to <laughs> not just showing up at uh in many many years is the terrificon in uh, connecticut at the mohegan suns casino at the end of july so i will be there that saturday and sunday which is july 31st and august 1st i believe so if you're in the northeast area it looks like an enormous convention with just tons of comic pros and and pop culture appearances so it looks like a great show overall so if folks are there come by get some things signed mispronounce my name all good things like that and i always have the uh like the uh link for your uh newsletter in our show notes so thank you thank you guys all right all so right you, you got a bail you're gonna go talk to mr dematis and um yes, sir. uh have fun with that and uh just let's touch base and figure out what our next chit chat's about 
Oh yes. Oh, I'll I'll let you know. Yes, we'll set up a time. But uh, next month, of course, I wanted to uh, loop into that Black Widow stuff. Uh, your uh, Punisher Six Black Widow views. story. Oh, excellent. That's a great. That's a great time. But Perfect. I think something other than Daredevil for once. But yeah, the Punisher Black Widow story. So. And the timing will be perfect, right? The, exactly. Uh, very well planned. I like it. I try. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids. So yes, just uh, find everything Capes and Lunatics at uh, link, uh, Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Capes and Lunatics. All our social media, this YouTube, you can watch the video, our Patreon, our merchandise. So yeah, go check us out there. All right. Uh, again, sir, thank you so much for your time. We always really appreciate it. It's always a great time. So, A lot of fun, guys. You have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.